The Tom Woods Show, episode 2228. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level, Tom Woods, is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught, with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. We've got an interesting episode ahead of us today, and indeed tomorrow also, because we're talking about a book written by our two guests today, Gary Richide and Charlie Westerman, called A Twisted History of the United States, 1450 to 1945. So, you know, I'm not going to say welcome, gentlemen, because you'll say thanks for having me on over each other. It just doesn't work when I have two guests. So instead, I'll ask you one at a time, or maybe one of you wants to take this, the origin of this project and how you chose what to some people might be considered rather idiosyncratic beginning and ending dates. I'll take that one, at least at first. First of all, I'm elated to be here. I have to say before we begin, I use the word elated because everyone says thrilled or happy or pleased to be here. I appreciate your (laughs) thesaurus instincts. (laughs) (laughs) And the reason for that elation is because the reason in large part I'm a libertarian is because of the host of this show. It was about 10 or 11 years ago when I picked up the Tom Woods podcast. I had read your books going back to the Politically Incorrect Guide. I had read how the Catholic Church built Western civilization, which I think are just masterpieces. Read a 33 questions about American history you're not supposed to ask. Loved them, used them in my classes. Got censored at the institutions at which I was teaching for using them. But I still snuck them in for the benefit of the students. So my elation is real and genuine. The origin of- And thank you for that, by the way. I appreciate that. Of course, yeah. The origin story of this book is really pandemic related. And that is- About two years ago, when I was dismissed from both institutions at which I was teaching for other reasons, in part being a libertarian, a Rothbardian, and someone who was actually teaching Mises, and was also critical of Pope Francis, but that's a little bit of a side story, I got an email, more so a message from Charlie, an old student of mine, saying, hey, what's going on? I'm doing this Reddit, and I'm writing on history. We should write a book. And I thought, wow. I remember Charlie. He was a good student. He wasn't in my AP class in high school, but he was in the honors class. So he was a good student. And he was always questioning the official narrative. And he had a unique idea. Somehow, could we incorporate historical tweets into a book that would serve as a revisionist alternative look, perhaps a supplemental text to the ordinary text that everyone was getting in their high school and college classes? But as the pandemic wore on, we saw as we were writing and creating this book and this tome that the book could serve a much greater purpose. And that greater purpose was to wake people up to the status narrative, the cathedral teaching, and the means by which the message of the state and government is so ubiquitous and powerful and entrapping. And the way to remedy this and further wake people up to the tyranny that was really all about them, but they weren't necessarily recognizing, was through a deep dive in our own American history. So that's really the origin story. I suspect Charlie could add to that. Yeah, I was writing on Medium, and I found a way to manipulate tweets through this basic HTML coding class to be able to basically make any tweet from any person ever. And once I found that out, I figured the possibilities were endless. So I wrote on Medium this article about Twitter during the Revolutionary War. I sent it to Gary saying, hey, I think you're going to like this. Gary's like, yeah, this is great, but you messed up some historical fact about Paul Revere or something that I messed up. Always a teacher, you know. And I said, let's just do a book on this. I think this would be such a great idea to be able to have Twitter throughout American history. And Right. I mean, I I want people to understand the whole book is not tweets, but they're scattered throughout. Correct. Okay. And incidentally, if I may jump in here, Michael Malice did this to me years ago in 2015. We did a debate in New York City on the legacy of Alexander Hamilton. And I was very anti and he was pro. That's the really almost the only thing I can think of that he and I disagree on. So we thought, let's have a public debate about it. And you can find it on YouTube. Just type in Woods, Malice, Hamilton, and uh, you'll see a video come up. 
There's also, if you type in Woods, Malice, Hamilton, there's a couple of episodes of my show where we talk about it. It's not that. It's the Mm -hmm. video of us debating. And it was a great debate, and we had a lot of fun. But throughout the debate, he was using a projection screen to put on that screen a bunch of tweets supposedly from Donald Trump that were dismissing me, (laughs) you know, saying, because I lived in Kansas at the time. So he's got Trump saying, Kansas, Nebraska, who can tell these rectangle states apart? You know, and he's just got one tweet after another mocking me, but absolutely nailing Donald Trump's tone. So it made it, it was a huge advantage for him because everybody was laughing hysterically about his tweets in the background. I still kicked him in the rear when the results came in in the debate, but it didn't matter. It was a lot of fun. And those tweets are what people remember <laughs> what people remember about it. So maybe yeah. they will be the memorable thing about your twisted history of the United States. Right. I remember that. They serve as good bookmarks throughout the book and throughout the story. So that's kind of the purpose of them. Like you said, it's not a book full of tweets. Now, the Tuttle Twins people just came out with a U.S. history for much younger people. So it's not in competition with yours. But what I suppose will be the first of multiple volumes begins in something like 1215 and ends in 1776. And I've said to them, just when it's getting good, you're going to end? <laughs> But 1215, I, you know, we all know there are certain years in Western history that we can associate with important events. Why, in your case, 1450? Why start? They got to start somewhere, I guess. Why there? The fall of Constantinople. In 1453, Constantinople falls to the Islamic Turks. We see that as a jumping off point for what ends up being the main drive impetus to European colonization, particularly by the Spanish We cast Columbus and I think his most appropriate and true historical light as, and there's a great book by Carol Delaney out of Stanford about Columbus and the quest for Jerusalem. People, as we tend to study in general survey American history courses, and this was certainly the case in the courses that I took throughout high school, graduate school and the like, was that we see, or what tends to be portrayed is that Spain is this emerging immense power in the 15th century. And then therefore, well, they, just like other powers, have this imperial impulse to expand. But in point of fact, Spain was just an emerging nation-state power as a result of the Reconquista being successful in the beginning of 1492. And because the East was therefore, in a sense, closed by the Islamic Turks taking over in Constantinople, that became a major drive and motivator for investigation westward And Carol Delaney, I think, makes a convincing point that he, in his quest, that is, say, Columbus and then other Spanish and Portuguese explorers, were really devoted. They were devout Catholics. They were Orthodox. And the monies that they wished to recoup from discovery and eventual colonization would be used for a crusade against the Muslims. So that's why we start off that as a jumping point, just because we want to emphasize that notion of European imperialism that often isn't touched upon. Well, let's move ahead to the colonial period. Obviously, there's a zillion topics we could hit, but let's just talk in general about the colonial period because there is a lot of emphasis in certain conservative circles on the American founding and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So the colonial period sometimes gets overlooked because they all want to fast forward to the way it all turns out. Are there any good reasons to look into the colonial period, other than because we're antiquarians, we want to know what kind of shoes they wore, stuff like that. But is there anything significant for the history of American liberty that is to be found in the colonial period that makes it profitable for us to do so? I would argue, just bouncing off your question, the relative insignificance early on of the Eastern colonies that the English established along the Eastern seaboard. I mean, to characterize English imperialism in the 16th and early 17th centuries, it's mostly based in piracy. And then the more profitable colonies, of course, as you know, within your historical works, are the Caribbean and Central and South American colonies. So the English, of course, do what was most practical. And they said, well, why go and enslave the Indians or create encomiendas and have this extremely expensive system by which we protect those colonies with a huge navy? Let's just employ privateers and steal it. Steal the bullion, the gold and silver from the Spanish. And indeed, solitary neglect, that idea that the English and then later British government after 1707 is 
really not involved in the implementation, the creation, and then the sustenance of the Eastern Seaboard Colonies. That is until, in large part, because of the immense freedoms and autonomy that those settlers had. By the way, a very diverse set of settlers from all over Europe. It was because of free enterprise that those colonies became profitable. In fact, I would argue because of the lack of attention that the British, English, and the British governments paid to them. That's a point that has to be emphasized that's, again, overlooked. I did an article, I guess it was, I can't remember if the article came first or the speech based on, who knows, but 20 plus years ago, I had a piece called The Colonial Origins of American Liberty. Mm. And one of the points I made was that I can think of three cases where there was some kind of confederation or proposed confederation. There was the Confederation of New England, right. where the Puritans gathered together in case of Indian attacks. There was the Dominion of New England in the, I guess, 1670s and 80s. And then there was the, the Albany Plan of Union proposed by Ben Franklin. Mm-hmm. And the significant thing to me is the first one of these, the New England Confederation, was that Massachusetts thought that in 1652, when Cromwell attacks the Netherlands, and so New England has been living without incident for some time in proximity to New Netherland, they could potentially get caught in this international conflict that's going on. And Connecticut and New Haven are beating the drums for exactly that. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts intervenes and says, now listen, when we created this confederation of New England, we never said it was to jump at the first chance to be involved in an offensive war. It was, if we are threatened, we will do it. And so Massachusetts objected, and it seriously weakened the Confederation of New England. Then the Dominion of New England, of course, was an early experiment in a kind of consolidation of a number of the colonies together. And eventually they ran the governor of that thing out of town. And then the Albany Plan of Union in 1754 didn't go anywhere. Nobody wanted it. And so these three things show us that a big part of the American tradition is local self-government. And we don't want to be part of some larger grouping that we're not sure we can control. That's a major lesson of the colonial period. Well said. And the Commonwealth of New England was supplanted by the Dominion, which is very good semantically because the New England colonies got together and created a cooperative institution to work together. And then, of course, Edmund Andros is sent over by the English government to impose the dominion, lording it over them, lording government and the Navigation Acts over them. And of course, in true American, I think authentic American spirit, well, the Bostonians kicked them out. Right, indeed they did. It was, it's a very dramatic and exciting moment in colonial history. And then they go back, the new, you know, William and Mary, they don't want to try to resurrect this thing. They just go back to letting the colonies be as they were before. Hey, everybody, I want to recommend a person to you. And that person is Mikkel Thorup, who was my guest on episode 2183. And Mikkel is the host of the Expat Money Show, which is the number one resource for anybody considering the expat lifestyle or offshore investments. Your host, Mikkel Thorup, has been an expat for over 20 years. He's visited over 100 countries and himself lived in nine. And so he has invaluable insight on the expat lifestyle. And that includes how to maximize international investments, how to move offshore for more freedom, privacy, and protection. You're going to gain vital knowledge on wealth protection, tax reduction, investing, migration, citizenship, residency, you name it. You're going to love Mikkel as a person because he's very knowledgeable without being an arrogant jerk. And the variety of topics he covers on the Expat Money Show, where he's telling you about all different countries, all different things you might want to do there, like buying property or getting a job, All this stuff is covered on the Expat Money Show. So go to expatmoney.com today. The link will be in the show notes. That's expatmoney.com or listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right. So in terms of the American War for Independence, I note in your book that you two share with me the same frustration over distilling that whole conflict into, quote, no taxation without representation. Ugh. I mean, what a boring <laughs> principle to fight over. You know, I, I just can't get over. But I, I have a theory that the reason this is emphasized is to make the American Revolution seem so weird and foreign to us today that, well, now you have representation with your taxes, so you have nothing to learn from these people. <laughs> no, we do actually have some 
we could stand to learn some things from these people, but only if the conflict they were involved in seems relevant to us. And no taxation without representation simply doesn't seem relevant to anybody today. Yeah, well, Tom, you're absolutely right. I think the real purpose of the modern hermeneutic toward an approach and interpretation of the revolution as no taxation without representation really shifts the focus away from mercantilism, which is really what the war and the fight is principally about. The ability of the colonies to act autonomously and freely, to engage in free enterprise and mercantile activity and productive capacities, given what they had seen as their right and duty going back to 1603 with the Jamestown Charter, that they were to be and be understood within English and then British law as full-fledged English subjects with all the rights, privileges that had been, in a sense, earned since 1215 with the Magna Carta. And it's then, therefore, no surprise that with the succession of British parliamentary and crown acts, which essentially put those colonists into a status within the then British Empire of adolescence. And if you, again, read the firsthand sources of the leading protagonists of the revolution, the Hancocks, the Adams, that is to say Samuel and John of the revolution, and Patrick Henry for that matter, to get a different region of the country involved, they're constantly complaining that in the sense of they felt it culturally, to be sure, when Washington's complaining that he's not getting the proper shipments of clothing of what's fashionable back in London in time or in a speedy fashion. But they felt it in their daily lives, this adolescentizing, if you will, of their place within the British Empire. They wanted to be an industrial base if they saw fit. They wanted to trade with whomever they saw fit. If the French were offering a better price for sugar from the French West Indies, or molasses, or rum, then they should be able to buy and sell with whomever they please, just as English merchants were able to back home. And mercantilism was the war against that, that freedom. To jump in, Gary, I think that taxation without representation, it makes it a lot more historical and political as opposed to economics. And we talk a lot about that in the book, Mm -hmm. how much some of these history books and texts don't include economics at all. And I think that's so frustrating, definitely to me, with how much we see money involved in our lives, how some of these history books don't include economics one bit. And they fear it like the plague, as we say in the book. Charlie, should I tell Tom that story about the AP conference or the yes, testing? Definitely. Yeah, you're not going to start that and then not tell. Yeah, me. right. So what is <laughs> <laughs> that? was my hook. Tom, you'll really enjoy this. So I was an adjunct at Loyola University, of Chicago, and then I was teaching in high school. And so, for a little extra money, I have four kids. I have two sons and two daughters. So, you know, just like the five daughters of the Tom Woods household, you got to find ways to put food on the table. So I agreed to go and do the test grading for the AP College Board in U.S. history. I had done it for a number of years. I was at lunch. The question that I was grading was on the Gilded Age. And naturally, there was some economics about, you know, bimetallism in one of the sources. I sat down at lunch with a group of fellow teachers and professors. And as I sat down, two of the teachers started complaining about the subject matter of the DBQ or document-based question. And so I just innocently inquired further. Okay, maybe not so innocently. And (laughs) they said, ah, I don't really even teach the Gilded Age in my class. And you know why? Because there's too much damn economics in it. And I just thought, oh my God, these poor students of these teachers, they don't have a fundamentally important discipline by which to understand human action in the proper historical context because they just don't like, their teachers don't like economics. It was so sad. So anyway. Well, in a way, it's almost better for them not to teach it then. That's true. You know, because I have seen people who just more or less teach what the textbook says. The textbook doesn't know any more than the honest teacher who says, I don't know anything about this. They just repeat what the previous textbook said, which repeats what the previous textbook said. So they're all confused about all this stuff. So it's, yeah, if they need to skip it, (laughs) let them. I'd rather have the kids have no knowledge of something than a twisted, ideologically slanted so called knowledge. So, you know, that's, isn't this 
such a world we live in that that I'm consoled that people aren't being taught something. Right. Well, no, you're right. I think of Bernard Lewis, the great Middle Eastern historian, saying that much damage could be done by poor history instruction. Better just not to teach it at all. Just avoid it. Yeah, you know, it's like what Jefferson said about newspapers, that uh, if you read the newspapers of the day, you would almost know more because your brain would be less screwed up than if you read no newspaper at all. That's right. You know, you know, so. That's right. Anyway, all right. So if you were to sum up, give me a sentence. What's the American War for Independence about? It's not a trick question. It's not a trap. I'm not going to say you're wrong. But if you had a student who was sleeping through your class but was going to be awake for one sentence, and so you got to make that sentence count, what is it? It's about freedom, the ability to harness and take your labor. And this is going to sound very Adam Smithian because I do emphasize a quote from him about this, about the revolution. As he was writing in 1776, as it broke out, he said, to prohibit a great people from doing all that they can with the fruits of their labor and direct it in the way that they judge most advantageous to themselves is a direct violation of the most sacred rights of mankind. That's almost a direct quote. You can tell I taught that a lot. But that was essentially it. There was that the colonists through their history as colonists within the English and then British empires believed fervently that whatever their ingenuity, their production, their productive capabilities, in a sense, their human capital, to use the economic phrase, it was theirs. It was theirs to direct. And what the British parliament had been doing was restricting that type of flourishing. And the I suppose, the joys of benefiting from the fruits of that labor. All right, now let's see. I, I'm trying to manage the time because I also want to do a second one of these. I don't want to start something impossibly large right now. But in terms of the Constitution, mm-hmm. obviously there's a lot of controversy here among our people <laughs> as to, you know, was the Constitution a coup or not? And, and, this and I mean, I still feel like the way to think about it, which may be different from your interpretation, is that the nationalists, yes, it's true that obviously there's a stronger central government after you have the Constitution, but that the nationalists did not get all they wanted at the convention. They didn't. They got a mostly decentralist document. So the way they won was through the interpretation of that document in the courts in succeeding decades. That was where the real victory came because you absolutely can interpret the constitution as a decentralist document. But if you choose not to, and likewise, if you choose to interpret it in such a way that it has powers beyond the ones explicitly granted, then you're off to the races. So the spirit of the constitution sort of echoing the spirit of Vatican II, if you will? I think there is something to that, yes. I'm in agreement largely with you. I would just emphasize more like dear Murray Rothbard that There were elements, particularly in the Hamiltonian camp, that I think were set up to eventually move toward that spirit. And you actually, well, you know a lot about this in regard of how duplicitous Hamilton was, talking about how in the Federalist Papers, the powers that were explicitly granted would not be divided, that he emphasized the presence of the Tenth Amendment when he was before a, well, let's just say more states' rights bent crowd. Of course, then when he has any sort of power, especially as Secretary of the Treasury, he's doing everything to create conditions by which a national bank can be formed. And then furthermore, with the Lewiski Rebellion, which we interpret, I think rightfully so, through the primary source materials, is just a big setup. I think it's a big setup so as to have Washington march a national army through a state and so therefore establish federal supremacy over the states in opposition to their autonomy and power. So I guess I'm between you and Murray Rothbard. I think the you're right in saying that in the letter of the Constitution, there are clear deferential parts to federalism, which is really the structure that we would all, like, particularly as libertarians, want to have the country pursue in a constitutional order. It just hasn't happened that way. I guess the proof is in the pudding because what is it just... Several decades later, we have a civil war over just the nature of that constitution. So the Hamiltonians win out, it seems, all the time, unfortunately. All right, let me t- take a look here, how we're doing. Oh, gosh, I am so bad at managing <laughs> at managing this. I'm so, all right, so what I think I'm going to do is, let's wrap up here, because there are other topics I want to hit on in your book that if we try to crack them open now, 
we'll run too far. And I, I, I'm going to keep this to the promised amount of time. So we're going to have you guys back tomorrow. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into this book. I might fast forward all the way to the 20th century. You never know. You're going to be on your toes okay, next time. Brilliant. So so thank you guys very much. Obviously, I'm going to have this book linked, the book we've been talking about, uh, A Twisted History of the United States, 1450 to 1945, linked on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2228. So thank you guys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Well, oh, actually, you know what? I can't start this yet. Uh, Gary, how do you say your last name? I was just going to say that it's it's rich-eyed, so it, it's really bad German, Tom. It is so, not pronounced that way. I know. It's terrible. Is it really? It is. It <laughs> should be Richied, I know, but it is actually anglicized during World War I. Uh, it used to be von Reitscheid, and then they just anglicized it. Yeah, but they... Butchered it. I don't want to insult your ancestors, but they anglicized it very badly. I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> rich I know, no, it's so true. Oh, my god. I goodness. wish it was Richied, but... Okay. All right. But on the other hand, it, it evokes this image of you having these giant pupils with dollar signs in them, you know? That's it. You're rich I, eyed. I, I also say I also say I should be like a Bond character, an evil villain, like rich eyed instead of golden eyed. Rich eyed. Yeah. All right. We'll start the whole thing over again. Okay, cool. All right. Here we go. Actually, you know what? You know what? Maybe Chris, maybe let's keep this. Put it as an Easter egg at the end of the episode. All right. <laughs> now, my, my insult to Gary's relatives. All right. You ready? <laughs> That's fine. Okay. They deserve All it. right. Here we go. Here we go. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.